We're going to be in Jeremiah 30 this morning, if you want to turn over there, and we're going to be talking about the coming kingdom. I want to give a little bit of backdrop to this before we just dive right in. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, it says, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. And the resurrection, when we're talking about the coming kingdom, it'll be our topic this morning as we go through Jeremiah 30 and uh, really the next four chapters, we'll be primarily focusing on the coming kingdom, is related to the resurrection. It's related to when, uh, when we receive our new bodies and when we'll be reigning or dwelling on the earth with the Lord during this time. Uh, Romans chapter 11, where Paul has uh, given us a lot of detail about Israel and, uh, and the new covenant and, and the way that these things interact with each other, picking up in verse 11 said, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Speaking of the Jews, certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failures riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And the fullness or the return of the promise we'll see in Jeremiah this morning, the return of the Jewish people will uh, be right at the turn of, of when the messianic kingdom begins. And continuing on there in Romans, he says, I speak to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Life from the dead, the, the resurrection, the being raised in Christ likeness. Now, there's a lot of disagreement and we can get caught up sometimes in the details when it comes to the kingdom. But when you, when you hear words uh, like the rapture, when you hear words like the messianic kingdom, the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ, uh, eternity with the Lord, all these things we're speaking about, things uh, dealing with or after the second resurrection, the resurrection in Christ. And it's called the first resurrection. I only called it the second because I mean it comes after Christ. That It's called the first resurrection, the resurrection of life, because the one that comes after it is the eternal judgment, the resurrection of the dead, where they're cast into the lake of fire forever. And so those who have died at the moment, if you're wondering, they're in, they're in torments. They're not in a good place right now, but they have not been cast into the lake of fire. That day is coming. It's a future event. And so there's a future resurrection that are coming for the followers of Christ, and there's a future resurrection of the dead, uh, one to everlasting life and one to eternal damnation. And these are coming on the timeline. And within these gets a large debates of what's dealing with Israel, what's dealing with the church, how much are the time frames literal. We're going to come at the scriptures from, from a plain reading, plain interpretation uh, I believe it is the oldest interpretation. It's not the most common in church history. Uh, uh, an allegorical interpretation would be the most common uh, view of this in Scripture. But the early church, the first hundred years, I believe the plain meaning was the common interpretation. Now, there is a lot of mention about the kingdom in the Gospels and, and throughout Scripture. But I feel that there is a little bit of emphasis in our time, or our understanding, and so I want to give a little bit of context, is one, we're looking at God's plan, okay? God had a plan in the creation, and he has a plan at the end, and when we get to the second resurrection, the millennial kingdom, and the eternal order, uh, we are dealing with God's sovereign plan. These things are already laid out. No one can stop them from happening. The only questions are, will you participate in them, 
Or will you be a part of the second resurrection, the resurrection of the dead? You'll be a part of one or the other. You have no option. These are, these are things that are put out by sovereign decree. This is God's outworking of history. And through the Gospels, he puts a large emphasis on the kingdom. Uh, he tells us that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He tells us, that's what Jesus said in his lifetime. He said that the kingdom uh, is coming. He said that the kingdom is inside you, or maybe a better uh, a translation of that is among you. And he also told us to pray for the kingdom to come. The apostles in Acts chapter 1, they asked the Lord, uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So the apostles, after the resurrection of Christ, are looking for a plain fulfillment, a plain reading of the fulfillment of the promises in the Old Testament. And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority. And so he told them, I'm not going to tell you when that happens. That's in God's uh, God's hands. It's not, not in your guys' hands. Now, Jesus knows. He's just telling them he's not going to tell them when that will happen. But there is a longing that we see in Scripture for this time. Daniel was longing for it. The apostles were longing for it. Jeremiah was longing for it. If you read the early church fathers, they were longing for it. And so we see this longing for the kingdom. And I want to grab a little uh, context for us of the kingdom in regards to that the church is the bride of Christ. Now, the church is the bride, and we're already betrothed, meaning in, uh, in the way Jewish weddings work, we're already legally married to Christ. And thank you, Lord, for that. But the wedding day hasn't happened yet. The wedding day is future. It's coming. It's described in Revelation chapter 19. When you get to Revelation chapter 20, you have the thousand-year reign of Christ. That's what we'll be reading about again this morning. And we will get to share in it with him uh, after the wedding ceremony. And, and so think of it much like uh, a honeymoon. Think of it in that. Now, one challenge that has happened for the church over the years with this honeymoon is the focus has become, is, it, is the church or Israel, and we're going to see where both have a place to play in this coming kingdom, but the focus is Christ. The focus is what he's done and his plans unfolding for history. That's the focus. We're the beneficiaries that were there. Uh, and, and we're supposed to have this joyful anticipation knowing that our wedding day is coming, and after the wedding day, we get a thousand years on the earth again with Christ reigning as supreme king. And that's supposed to excite us. It's supposed to excite us like when you are engaged and you're looking forward to your honeymoon. You should be looking forward to that fellowship. And it shouldn't just be a self-interest. You should be wanting to uh, be uh, celebrating the life with your spouse that you're about to begin. And we'll be celebrating the eternity we're about to begin with Christ. Amen? And so this is the context for us as we dive into our, our text. Now, again, there's a lot of disagreement in the body of Christ as to the timing of the millennium uh, or the exact ways that it plays out. And I, I think Justin Martyr, who was at 155 approximately AD, he said this, he said, I and others who are right-minded Christians on all points are assured that, we'll, that there will be a resurrection of the dead and a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built, adorned, and enlarged, as the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah and others declare. And so I think that we are in a vein of good, solid theology within our approach. But I also want you to know that the same Justin Martyr said, many who belong to a pure and pious faith, and our true Christians think otherwise. Think otherwise. Uh, and, and we know by the date 150 approximately, uh, so the church is about 100 years old, there's already a lot of debate on if these things should be understood allegorically 
or plainly. Now, if you go back before him, we have some other church fathers uh, who would also be in the plain group. And, then I, and some after, Irenaeus was also with this same view, expecting this literal reign of Christ for a thousand years. But within this, we also see the struggle has gone back into church history 1,900 years. And we need to remember like what Justin said, hey, there's, there's a right way he thinks of thinking about it. I think there's a right way for us to approach the scriptures. But there are many who belong to a pure and pious faith and true Christians that think otherwise. Don't let it, the body of Christ be divided over exactly how we think this will unfold. Rejoice in that the whole body of Christ believes in our coming resurrection. And if they don't think, I don't think it's going to be a literal thousand years, well, we'll see when we get there. I'm going with a literal thousand, but if I'm wrong, I'm going to be there. That's the main point. That's the main question is, are you going to be a part of the resurrection? And so so we, we come at it with our theological views, but we also don't want these views to become divisive in the body of Christ. Amen? We have to remain in unity with our brothers and sisters. So we covered the first few verses last week uh, (laughs) before the fire alarms went off, but uh, Lord willing, we won't have any fire alarms this morning, and we're going to cover them again real quick just uh, to get into our text. So beginning in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I'll bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. So remember that Jeremiah is writing in a time of a rebellious people. And God tells him, write these things in a book. And I'm thankful he told him that. And I'm sure he told it to him for his own personal benefit, because he had a very discouraging ministry. Uh, as far as in his lifetime, and these are encouragements because so much of what Jeremiah prophesied was warning and destruction and judgment coming, and he also got to prophesy about the coming resurrection, God's end plan for Israel. And so this is something of a great encouragement that he gets to declare. And he says, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I'll bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord. Now, remember, the northern kingdom called Israel fell around 722 B.C. This is the southern kingdom of Judah that falls at 586 B.C., and it's almost uh, at that time. Uh, you know, we're, we're really close within a few years at this point, I believe, in this text uh, of that downfall, probably between 586 and 591 B.C. Uh, and so he's writing very close to this time. And there is a promise not just to bring Judah back, But the other nation, the nation of Israel, the the northern kingdom, is conquered by Assyria. God's going to bring them back as well. And it says that they will return to the land. We know elsewhere from Jeremiah that they'll return after 70 years. But most of this passage, when we get to it, and we'll see, and, and he'll tell us it plainly, is not dealing with when they come back after 70 years. It's dealing with when God regathers them at the at the last days. At the end, uh, as explained to to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, at the completion of the 77s. And this book uh, of Jeremiah, again, is where in it is, it has so much correction for the people. This chapter we're in is the highlight of the book. This is the, the fun part of the book. Judgment is falling on Judah, but God is promising restoration. Now, as we look at God's restoration here, we need to remember it's not because they deserved it. It's not because they earned it or were going to earn it. It's not because they were going to atone for their own sins. He does it according to grace. This is part of God's master plan for Israel. It is why it will be accomplished. In the end, God will restore them despite their rebellion, their their sins, and their spiritual adultery. Uh, And that's reaffirmed for us by the Apostle Paul in Romans 9 through 11, in Ephesians 2 and 3, uh, by the Apostle John in Revelation, and by Daniel and and other prophets as well. 
Moving on to verse 4, it says, Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Notice again on the, the emphasis on the uh, complete Jewish people, the, the whole nation, not the divided part, not the, just the southern or the northern. For thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with a child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins, like a woman in labor, and all faces turned pale? Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. As we see here, the people being gathered at this time are in a state of fear, trembling, and not of peace. Verse 7 calls it a time of Jacob's trouble. It's compared to birth pains. And the imagery, I believe, shouts to us about the great tribulation, about the end times, the final seven-year period uh, that we're told about that will happen at the, uh, at the end of this age. And the end of it will lead to Israel's repentance and restoration, but not until they have gone through the seven years. And it will be a time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, we get this time frame from Daniel, from Revelation, but Daniel uh, 9.27 and Daniel 12 give us this time frame as long with Revelation chapter 12. And it says that the day is great and that there is none like it. It's similar to what Jesus said also in Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22, as he is speaking about the last days. He says, there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, the elect Jesus is speaking of in these verses, I believe, is clearly referring to Israel, not the church. Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 28, where Paul is speaking about Israel, he says, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And these days will be shortened for the elect's sake, and I believe that that is a reference uh, to the Jewish people. I believe by that time, we as the church will be, thankfully, long gone. We will be with our Lord and Savior, hopefully by that time, preparing for a wedding. But the tribulation will be the hardest time in all of human history. And the nation that will feel it more than any other nation will be the nation of Israel. It will be a time of Jacob's trouble. But what we are also being revealed to us in Scripture is that through all these events, God is in control. And his plans that he has foreordained for the nation of Israel and for us as the church will be fulfilled because God will uphold them, because God will bring them about. And our peace, our confidence comes from him. And, uh, and so this text, though, tells us before Israel is restored, they will go through this hardship, this time of travail or suffering, before they are brought to a position of repentance. Verse 8 says, It shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. But this restoration is coming to the Jews, and praise the Lord for us is coming for us as well. Now, we know this hasn't yet been, happened yet because it says foreigners shall no more enslave them. And this again talking about the Jewish people, northern and southern kingdom. And how do we know that this hasn't happened yet? Well, last October, Jews were taken captive. And there's still some of them being held today. There were, uh, um, exactly what it says, they were in, essentially in, enslaved. They're taken against their will. They're held against their will. But in the Messianic kingdom, no one will take Jews captive. That will not happen. God will not allow it. And I think it's likely that the Jews have already been gathered in preparation for their time of trial. I don't believe the time of trial is here yet. 
Uh, but then when it hits, it will bring the nation to repentance, and it will because God has already foreordained it. It also affirms in our text that the nation will serve the Lord their God and that David will be their king, who he will raise up for them. Well, there's a few things we can grab from that. First, after this happens, again, the nation is going to serve the Lord. That, again, hasn't happened yet. But when we get to the Messianic kingdom, as he continues on, we'll know that they will all be, all the Jewish people will be serving the Lord that are there. It does not mean that everyone that was ever born a Jew is going to be saved, but those who are alive through the tribulation, who repent and turn to Christ in faith, they will remain, and they will serve the Lord faithfully through that thousand years. He also says, David, their king, whom he will raise up. Now, most commonly, people see this as a reference to Christ, who is the son of David, uh, as was promised. And that's definitely the most common interpretation, is this is just a reference to, uh, to Jesus. Others see it as a more uh, literal interpretation that it is, in fact, the resurrected David, as we know he will be resurrected to partake in this time, and that he will reign over Israel, and that Christ will reign over the entire world, the church also co-reigning under Christ uh, over the nations. I lean towards this being David, but either one is really quite fitting. And and the emphasis again uh, in this coming kingdom overall is on Jesus. Even if David's there, the glorious part is that he was part of the resurrection. Somebody raised him from the dead. That's the glorious part. And that's the one we want to be focused on. Now, in this time period, I believe that, uh, that what we'll see is the focus is on worshiping Jesus, our Savior. And, uh, and at this point, when we get to the Messianic kingdom, I believe we will already have our resurrected bodies. So we'll actually participate in this thousand years but our sin nature will already be completely removed. And so we'll be, uh, we, we will think like the Lord, and, and when we think of our worship, when we think of our enjoyment of him, of our fellowship with him, we'll come with perfect minds. No more separation by sin. We'll be able to be there physically also with the Lord. Uh, but, but we will be in a completely different state of mind And can you imagine how sweet the worship and the fellowship will be in this time? I think about that. I was thinking about this last few weeks, waking up to a sunrise with an entirely sin-free mind. And not only that, but God's glory in full view. And we will have seen and will be able to see the risen Savior, will see the scars in his hands that were paid for our redemption so that we could share an eternity with him. Think about this reality. What kind of worship would that bring out of our hearts? What kind of love would that bring out of our hearts? I said, it's a lot like a honeymoon phase as we get to delight in, Lord, look what you have done, and we get to be with you. And so we'll be in the world, but we will not be living any longer like the world. We will not resemble the world in any way. And we will experience during this time the most blessed union with God that we have ever known. Uh, So this is something we're supposed to be, again, looking forward to as the church body. This time where we get to experience this new fellowship, nothing at all separated. We are getting to walk in this resurrection life with Christ. And this is the longing of the early church. It's it's written in the Gospels. There's over 100 references in the four Gospels to the coming kingdom. And it's the desire of Israel, and it should also be for us the desire of the church. So continuing on in verse 10, it says, Therefore do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid. For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. But I will correct you in justice 
and will not let you go altogether unpunished. Listen to the term that God uses there, my servant Jacob. Jacob, of course, it takes us back to Genesis. Jacob had 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel, and God changes his name from Jacob, one who wrestles with God, to Israel. And we see here that God is still personally attached to Israel, as he'll affirm several more times in our text, my servant Jacob. Again, I'll remind you, it's not just a promise to the southern kingdom or just to the northern kingdom, but by referencing Jacob, he includes all 12 tribes. Now, he also tells us he will punish Israel, and we're still seeing that today, but he will not abandon her. See, we see that Israel has been a persecuted group since this time, 2,500 years ago, but they're still here, and at the moment, they are a nation again back in their land, and so God says, I will correct you, but I will not abandon you. And we can see 2,500 years later, there's been a lot of correction, but there hasn't been abandonment. We get to testify to exactly what God said. In verse 12, for thus says the Lord, your affliction is incurable. Your wound is severe. There is no one to plead your cause that you may be bound up. You have no healing medicines. All your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you. For I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins have increased. Why do you cry about your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable. Because of the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins have increased, I have done these things to you. Therefore, all those who devour you shall be devoured, and all your adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall become plunder. And all who prey upon you, I will make prey, for I will restore health to you and heal you of your wounds, says the Lord. Because they called you an outcast, saying, this is Zion. No one seeks her. Well, Israel, he says, has an incurable wound, and she's been forsaken by all her lovers, all the other nations or false gods they have gone after And God himself has wounded her like an enemy. He is the one giving this correction. He is the one that is even calling uh, Babylon to come and carry them into captivity. She has an incurable wound. What are an incurable people to do? You know, when Jesus was talking with his disciples uh, about a, a rich man and how difficult it was for them to be saved, Uh, the, the disciples said, Lord, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And who can cure an incurable wound? Who can cleanse sinners? Who can forgive sins? Who can raise the dead? Who can make us fit for the kingdom of God? And there's only one answer to that question. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. There's only one answer to that question. There's only one way into the kingdom of God. In verse 18, it says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I'll bring back the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places. The city shall be built upon its own mound, and the palace shall remain according to its own plan. Then out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of those who make merry. I will multiply them, and they shall not diminish. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as before, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all who oppress her. God's speaking all these blessings to Israel in the midst of their rebellion. And a nation that's about to be conquered by Babylon because they have refused to turn from their idolatry. A a nation that's given over to all kinds of sexual immorality. And God's speaking these words of blessing over them. It reminds me of Romans 5.8. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Israel, like each of us, was never chosen because of their good works but because of God's good grace, amen? 
So continuing on in verse 21, it says, Their nobles shall be from among them, and their governor shall come from their midst. Then I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For who is this who pledged his heart to approach me, says the Lord. This verse seems to be speaking of our Savior, Jesus, uh, who is both the king, governor, and our priest, and he approaches the Father. In verse 22, he says, You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it, until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will consider it. Well, God is going to keep his promises to Israel, and he makes clear with his closing statement of this chapter that he is speaking of a future time, not an immediate time, uh, but uh, at the end or the conclusion of these things. Continuing on to chapter 31, he says, At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Listen to these things here. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. This seems to be speaking right after, of, of right after the great tribulation. He says there, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Uh, Those who reject him have perished, but those in the end that were alive in Israel that humbled themselves, that turned to Christ, that cried out to him, were in fact delivered. But listen to what God says to them. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Think about that for a minute. Now, as we talk about these different blessings and that the messianic kingdom is like the celebration of a marriage. Look at the tender words God uses in this time frame. I have loved you with an everlasting love. We might be tempted to think that it was God's firm correction was his his tool towards them. Uh, But we see, though, that God is firm in his correction. What they deserved was far worse They deserve to be cut off as a nation, to be destroyed. God, in his grace, he's punishing them, but he's not done with them. He has a plan for their restoration where they will enjoy eternity with him. And Romans 2.4 tells us the goodness of God leads you to repentance. And so as we think about Israel here, and we think, well, yes, they're going to get this strong repentance... But as they acknowledge that they have sinned, it's the goodness of God that really causes us to cry out because we can finally see, Lord, I need you, but it's his love that assures us he's there for us if we cry out. It's the part of him that lets us know, Lord, if I come humbly to you, he who seeks finds. And so the same is for us, is the same for Israel. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. Now, as we've gone through this book in Jeremiah 2, you have noticed that Israel is an adulterous wife. That's how God has displayed her. That's how he has called her out. You have been unfaithful. And, uh, and he even goes over that back in, uh, in chapter 3 very strongly. But listen to what he says here, virgin of Israel. Now, how did that happen? How did that happen? What is clearly indicated for us? Her sins are washed away. They're completely gone, just as God promised. He said at the end of the seven-year period in Daniel uh, 9.24 that he would make an end of their sin. He affirmed it, Paul did, in Romans 11.28. And their sin is gone. And when he said he wouldn't remember their sin, I want you to see in the Messianic kingdom how Israel's described. She's not described as an adulterous wife that's been forgiven. She's described as perfectly clean, as if she never sinned. Her sin's been entirely 
removed from her. This is the joy of the new covenant we get to share in. When we get to heaven, how are we made clean? And we see here that God takes an adulterous wife and through the power of the cross brings her back to a place where she's pure just as she never sinned, justified before God. And that, I think, is one of the best pictures for us when it says God doesn't remember our sins anymore. In in eternity, none of these past mistakes are going to define us. And again, as we think about this fellowship with Christ, living in that reality where we wake up with our full new nature in the image of God, can you imagine how much we're going to want to express love and worship to him? How much hearts of thankfulness are going to overpour how much we're going to delight in what he has done for us. This is a time for us to look forward to as a time of rejoicing. It's the rejoicing of Israel, and it's also the rejoicing of the church. He says, you shall again be adorned with your tambourines, in verse 4, and shall go forth in the dance of those who rejoice. You shall yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and eat them as ordinary food. For there shall be a day when the watchman will cry out on Mount Ephraim, Arise, and let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. The remnant is those who follow by faith. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the women with child, and the one who labors with child together. A great throng shall return there. They shall come with weeping and with supplication. I will lead them. This is how they will return. He says, I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He who scattered Israel will regather him as a, as, and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. I want you to read that passage. I want you to think about it again. This is, this is a time, the, the Messianic kingdom, it is a time of rejoicing in the goodness of God. It is experiencing the blessings uh, of everything that Christ has done for us, and what he's also going to do here for the nation Israel. Now, I want you to notice also here is he said, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. And so he who scattered the Jews, he will regather them. Now, a challenge for people who take these things allegorical, and I'm not trying to give an attack, but I want to lay these things out for clarity for you guys. The challenge is, is we know that the judgments fell to the Jewish people. And if, you, if we want to look at it allegorically, we have to read the first half of the verse would apply to the Jewish people. The second half of the verse would apply to the church. And so we would have to split our hermeneutics. Or or the way that we interpret Scripture. We have to say, well, this verse should be interpreted literally, and this verse should be interpreted allegorically, this section of it. And and I believe that's what Justin Martyr had in mind when he said that people with that view shall not be found consistent with themselves. They're applying two different methods there to their interpretation, to which several of them openly, openly admit. And again, I'm not attacking right there, but I want to make a clear distinction is why do we hold to the plain view? Because we think there's going to be a consistency in the Scriptures. Just as he fulfilled the first one, we expect him to fulfill the second one in like manner. Just as he scattered them literally, we expect him to gather them literally in similar fashion. Uh, verse 11, he said, The Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Israel, at this point, will be delivered from sin. At the end of the Great Tribulation, the picture that we have is that they're on the run, and the Antichrist is coming for them. And if they didn't cry out to God, they would be destroyed. That's the picture that we get of the the end in which Israel will be saved out of. And so when it says that the Lord has redeemed them and ransomed from the hand of one stronger than he... Well, we see that even in a physical sense, though, of course, even a much more, he's delivered them from their sin. 
He delivers them from Satan. He delivers them from the Antichrist. And even cutting the great tribulation to a close, he spares them. And we also will be delighting again through this period in our deliverance from sin and the fallen nature that we inherited from Adam. Verse 12, he says, Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming to the goodness of the Lord. For wheat and new wine and oil, for the young of the flock and the herd, their, sh- their souls shall be like well-watered garden, and they shall sorrow no more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old together. For I will turn their mourning to joy, will comfort them, and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. I will satiate the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. All these promises that are written to the Jews here, for us as the church, we get to be partakers in this messianic kingdom, in the kingdom of Christ, with them. And we already have a citizenship here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. When we place our faith in Christ, We become citizens of his kingdom, but it's also coming, just like we're already the bride of Christ, but they haven't had the wedding day yet. And and all these promises that are given here for the Jews, by the grace of God, as Paul tells us in Romans 11, we've been grafted in. Now, there's some parts that are going to apply to just them of, of, of the land and different things, but the overall blessings and the benefits that come from being in this kingdom, we've been grafted in. We've been grafted into that covenant, as he's about to describe uh, in a few verses for us. Verse 15, he says, Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children, because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord. And they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. Verse 18, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. You have chastised me, and I was chastised. Like an untrained bull, restore me, and I will return. For you are the Lord my God. Surely after my turning, I repented, and after I was instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. I was ashamed, yes, even humiliated, because I I bore the reproach of my youth. Listen to verse 20. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For though I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. Well, the Lord is correcting Israel. We know that. But he also says that he's a dear son. And this is where we're getting the heart of the Father, the heart and the promise of restoration. And the lamentation, the death, the weeping are all things Israel has been experiencing for the last 2,500 years. But yet, there remains hope in their future, says the Lord. He says, I spoke against him earnestly. I earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. He tells them to set up a signpost, to make landmarks, to repent, to, uh, to turn back, O virgin of Israel. Turn back through these, your cities. And as we look at these things, we see the call for God to, call, to, to, uh, to calling the nation to repentance, but also the promise that in the end, the nation will repent and will be given a pure heart. Verse 23, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, they shall again use this speech in the land of Judah and in its cities, which I bring back their captivity. The Lord bless you, O home of justice and mountain of holiness. He continues on with these promises. And he promises uh, of goodness, of satisfaction to them. He says in verse 27, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down, to destroy and to afflict, So I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no more, uh, in those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set 
on edge. Well, God's promise to make Israel fruitful and to increase during the Messianic kingdom. And this would seem uh, to be for those who survive the Great Tribulation. If I understand the different timings that are laid out in Scripture correctly, we again will already have our resurrected bodies. Jesus says we will be like the angels. We will not be marrying or given in marriage. Uh, we'll be married to Christ and no one else as the church. Um, and so this, this repopulating the area, I don't believe it directly applies to us. I think that would apply to those who are saved out of the tribulation period. One of the things the Jews also taught at this time is that they were paying a debt for the sins of their parents. And he says, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But it would seem that he's saying in the Messianic kingdom that this blame game that started back in Genesis 3 will finally end. Remember, uh, Adam, why did you disobey? Well, it was the woman. And the woman, why did you disobey? Well, it was the serpent. And, and Israel is now, well, why are we going into captivity? Well, because of the sins of our parents. And in the Messianic kingdom, it's finally the, the, uh, the reality that there are no excuses for our sins. We are self-accountable. And if we're not covered by the blood of Christ, we will give an account for our sins, not other people. But we will not be, uh, you will not be excused of these different things, of, of rejecting um, Christ. You don't get excused from it if you had a bad childhood. You don't get excused from it if your parents were sinners. And there may be consequences to your parents' sins that you feel in your life. But if you receive Christ or you reject Christ, you're personally accountable for that. If you follow him or you reject his ways, you're personally accountable for that. You don't get to, to on judgment day, stand before God, Lord, the only reason I was a terrible person is because I had terrible parents. Because that, that's not going to justify you. All right, but in the messianic kingdom, it seems that those excuses will be gone. Verse 31, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people." No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I'll forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. And this is the promise of the new covenant. Uh, this is the covenant for us that we have been grafted into through Christ. Notice that this covenant that is given to them, this promise, it wasn't conditioned. It wasn't because of their good behavior. It was promised to them as they're backslidden. It was God's love, God's goodness, and God's sovereign plan of salvation that was foreordained that would be carried out. And it is the only way to enter into the kingdom is through this new covenant. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have to understand, as we talk about the eternal things coming, the only way to share in the kingdom is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is the only way. He says we're born once into Adam, and everyone born in Adam is born a sinner. And if you're not born again into Christ, then we'll stand before him condemned in our sin and guilt. And so there is no other way. Jesus is not a way. He's not just the best way. He is the only way way into the kingdom. I also want you to pay attention that this covenant is not established by us. It's not upheld by our works. It's upheld by God and his work. The covenant was sealed and it put in full effect at the cross. This is God's covenant. And just as it has blessed the church, it will also one day bless the nation of Israel. And when the nation of Israel is finally fully repentant and blessed by this new covenant, then the kingdom will come and we'll get to share in it all together. That's the promise that's given to us. Verse 35, thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. 
If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundation of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord. And he goes on to give the physical uh, uh, marks for where the city will be. God's promises, though, we are told here, they'll be upheld for eternity. How confident can we be in the new covenant? How uh, confident can the nation of Israel be that they will be restored? Well, they will stand more confidently, he says, than his covenants or his order with the sun. More sure than that the sun will rise every day, the nation of Israel will be redeemed. But also for us is the assurance that we will be redeemed because we've been brought into this covenant. How confident can we be if our faith is in Christ and what he has done for us that, that our sins are paid in full and that we'll spend eternity with him? We should have complete confidence in what he has done. Not a confidence in us, not a confidence in our works. And as we think about the end times, what he is referring to here is is getting to the great tribulation. This is common things talked about in our time. One of the things we have to be careful of is there can be a spirit of fear. And and I want you to notice that he tells even even Jacob, who's going to go through the worst troubles, do not fear It's going to be a hardship, but God has a master plan, and we have to have confidence and peace going, God, you have a master plan, and there's nothing that anyone in the world or in any angelic realm can do to alter the covenants that you have set up, to stop your master plan from happening. I will dwell in your kingdom if I follow by faith, more sure than the sun will ever rise again, that you will raise those who are in Christ. But the question that we still have to wrestle with this morning, personally, is where are you going? Where are you heading? We're all heading one of two places. Are you heading to the kingdom? Where will you be? The only thing we really should be concerned about is am I following God by faith? Do I trust him regardless of the path ahead? Am I confident in what he has done? Where will you be when this all comes to pass? In his kingdom or cast into outer darkness? Rejoicing with joy greater than you've ever known? Or suffering without hope at all? God's given an invitation. He invites you this morning. He's provided a means by which all can share in his kingdom with him through Jesus Christ. And as this new promised covenant that has been offered not just to the Jews, but to all who turn to God in faith. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And do you know this morning that you're a sinner, that you fall short of the righteousness of God? Don't try to earn your way. The Pharisees tried that. They're much more religious and righteous than you would by human appearance, and they got nowhere near the kingdom. You cannot earn your righteousness. If it was not for divine intervention... All that stands between us and eternal suffering is a short span of time. But praise God, there was divine intervention because of his love towards you and me, like his love for Israel. And he humbled himself and became a man, and he was holy and perfect in nature in all that he did, perfect as God the Father, and died in our place to take our judgment upon himself. He told us that we have to be born again or we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You cannot get there any other way than through faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot earn it. You cannot give enough. You cannot serve enough. You must look to the cross. You must confess, Lord, I am a sinner. Lord, please save me. Cry out perhaps even, Lord, I am an evil man, sinful and wicked, but I look to you for salvation. He is able to separate your sins as far as the east is from the west, to take an adulterous wife and make her a pure virgin. Amen? So God's calling 
Will you respond? That is the main question we want to ask this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your covenant. We thank you for your promises. The promises and plans you have foreordained for Israel and the promises and plans you have foreordained for your church. We thank you, Lord, that we're assured that we will spend eternity with you and that we will be in your kingdom. Of course, Lord, that is us who respond to your covenant and what you have done in faith. And Lord, I lift up uh, everyone here to you this morning. Lord, if anyone in here doesn't truly belong to you, Lord, maybe they've even been a part of the church a long time, but Lord, they've never really turned to you to be their righteousness. Lord, they're still covered in their sin. I pray, Father, that right where they're sitting, that they would surrender their life to you. Lord, that they would see I'm not fit for your kingdom. Lord, come and wash away my sin that I might be made clean, that I might dwell with you forever. And Lord, for those of us that do know you, Lord, those who have been born again through Christ, Lord, I pray that there would be such a longing in our hearts and a looking forward to this day. Lord, that we wouldn't be a bride that is uh, unconcerned about her wedding day or what follows, but that it would be our daily dream that we would be with you and dwell with you forever. That we are dreaming, Lord, of what it will be like to be in your presence and to experience all of your goodness then and for all eternity. Thank you for your promises, Lord. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your incredible work. In Jesus' name, amen.